Okay, we're back, we're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, Marco, Mina, and me on Mondays talking about energy. Uh, our guests are Marco and Marco Mangelsdorf and Mina Marito. Welcome to the show, you guys. Hi, oh, great to be, be back on. on. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> great to be back on with, uh, with the three of us. Thank you so much for, for having us, Jay, today. All right, yeah, we're delighted to have you. We're going to talk about the fall of solar, the fall, decline and fall of solar in Hawaii as reported by Dwayne Shimagawa in today's PBN with, with help from Marco Mangelsdorf um, and in so many other articles that have detailed the decline of solar installations over the past year or two. Uh, Dwayne reported that Hawaii's rooftop solar energy industry continues its decline according to new permit figures. Um, he pointed out that last month the city uh, and county of Honolulu <coughs> Department of Planning and Permitting issued 194 permits, the fewest in five years according to data from our own Marco. Uh, of ProVision Solar. But compared to January 2016, there was a drop of 52% of permits last month. On the Big Island, the county issued 45 permits last month, compared to 141 permits the same month last year, a drop of 68%. And last month, the county of Maui issued 54 permits, compared to 233 permits a year ago, a drop of 76%. So Marco, you said, I am running out of gloomy metaphors to describe what's happening to the rooftop solar industry. And you continue to be struck by the mega chasm between all the talk of achieve, achieving renewable goals sooner while a vital industry with us away. There's a disconnect. So Marco, you know, how strongly do you feel about that anyway? Well, I mean, uh, I think I'm typically not someone who's prone to, to hyperbole. And I'm, I'm sure I have something of a rep now over the past months, if not longer, as somewhat being a, uh, a solar Cassandra, uh, seeing gloom and doom uh, always on the horizon, if not on the horizon, you know, actually in our midst. But I have to say that uh, in this sense, the numbers do not lie, and you cited them uh, accurately in terms of the PV permits that have been issued by uh, City and County of Honolulu, County of Maui, and uh, the County of Hawaii in January. And to me, uh, it's nothing short of, uh, you know, really big, big bad news and, and shows that the adoption rate for rooftop solar has uh, gone down precipitously uh, since its peaks back in 2012 and 2013. And, of course, I mean, of course, as a business owner who lives and breathes putting uh, PV systems on people's roofs, uh, both homeowners and business owners, that I have a vested interest. I mean, that states the obvious, and I'm not ashamed of that. And I would like very much for rooftop solar to continue to, to if not grow, at least stabilize so that it can keep uh, enough of us uh, happy and healthy in terms of an adequate revenue and reasonable and sustainable profit. But I really wonder uh, seriously, and I went, was at a trade show uh, on the Kona side over the weekend and talked to a number of my fellow PV people, and there's a tremendous amount of concern you guys, a tremendous amount of, of anxiety. And it really, uh, on the kind of more macro level, if I take off my Marco self-interest and hat and ProVision Solar self-interest hat, uh, to what extent should we value the continued uh, vitality and existence of rooftop solar here in Hawaii? Uh, it, I mean, it's a policy question. It's a political question. And we have uh, the Public Utilities Commission, which has a role. We have the legislature, we, which has a role. We have the governor, which has a role. We have other energy stakeholders, and they have roles. I mean, what value should be put on rooftop solar in terms of the benefits it provides versus the costs, including tax credits, that is money that does not go into the state's general fund? Should we, as I put, uh, quoted in, uh, in Dwayne's piece, should we double, triple down on utility-scale solar because it's cheaper? and uh, let rooftop solar kind of go along the wayside. So those are, you know, to some extent rhetorical questions, but, uh, you know, I, I throw it out there for discussion because well, we're really mean, at a, yeah. an existential place at this point regarding the, the local PV industry and rooftop solar. So where do we go from yeah, here? We're at, we're at a tipping point, and I agree with you when you say that. So um, I guess the question, uh, we should put the question to you, Mina. You live on Kauai. You've seen tremendous growth of solar there, but the solar now is utility scale. Uh, they put, uh, you know, a couple of installations on, and they've got more planned, and they're, they're successful in, in growing solar, but it isn't necessarily on rooftops. Uh, what, what's the story? How do you feel about what Marco's saying? Well, I, I, I agree with, um, you know, 
in some parts with Marco um, about the, the growth. Um, you know, we, we're on an island grid, and there's only so much that can go into the grid at any particular time. And um, but I, I and I think when you look at the overall picture at how many people are actually being served by rooftop solar, it's still a small amount. I mean, the majority of customers are being served by the electric utility. And so there's a real critical economic issue here that needs to be looked at very carefully as we move forward in, in policy where, you know, I don't think anybody wants to continue to oversubsidize an area at the expense of of um, ratepayers and taxpayers. Um, so there's some real economic issues that need to be discussed. Well, let, me, um, let me offer this thought, though. That, I mean, we're on a we're on a road to 100 uh, percent, and the world is too. I mean, solar has expanded exponentially on, on the mainland and in Europe. Um, and so this is this is going to slow us down, don't you agree? And and if it slows us down, then um, you know we're going to be behind the curve instead of ahead of it. We're not going to be a positive laboratory. We're going to be a negative laboratory, and we're not going to make our goals. I mean, that that's the real risk here. And so if that's the case, well, assume with me for well, a I moment. Think, I if think, that's the case. I think then the, the question the, the is, thing that we have we to look at carefully is, should we're not we going to make our goals with solar alone. You know, and and what we're kind of. You know, what we need is a diverse portfolio. And, you know, given, given the lower capacities of solar, you, you can't rely on solar to make your goal unless you're going to invest in more expensive technology, um, such as storage. And, I, you know, there's a real important question about who's going to bear this cost. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's a big question. And the question, of course, is that if you, if you find that, you're, that the success of the project, the success of this 100% initiative is, in fact, dependent on solar, and solar costs money, and you can't do solar without state money, then the project is dependent on putting money in. Uh, and if we don't put money in, we won't make our goals. I mean, as some people feel you know, that we're in big trouble that way because the legislature is not going to put the money in. And therefore, we have a we have a goal that can't be met. Marco. Well, it's it's a thorny, uh, challenging issue, and I certainly hear what Mina is saying. Uh, I've been in solar now for almost forty years, and one of the things, as a self-described true believer in solar, is that there's really no other energy source which is as democratic as it is as solar is, which means in practicality that it's possible to have your own mini power plant on your roof that is offsetting part or even all of your electricity needs and what kind of value do you put on that uh, I, I think it's worth something but you know as you're coming up with a methodology or some type of equation uh, it, which is based on quantifiable numbers right what kind of value do you put on empowering, literally empowering people to be able to take a little bit more control of their own power situation in terms of generating their own hot water, generating part or all of their own electricity. So you know, how much are we driven by the bottom line in a narrow sense in terms of having 10, 15, 20, 100 megawatt utility scale systems that is selling power to the utility company at 11 cents a kilowatt hour with storage or, or even less because clearly the trend lines are uh, utility scale solar is going down in cost just like all solar is going down in cost. And I don't have the answer here, but I think and I, I really believe that there is an intrinsic value that is not necessarily completely quantifiable uh, for the benefit that argues for the benefit of allowing people to have a degree, a greater degree of their own energy independence. Well, let me let me say that uh, that that doesn't wash for somebody who um, doesn't have solar on his roof. I I don't have solar on my roof, and um, I I'm, I don't care if somebody else has a control benefit or not. I would like to see it, and you said it too. Is you know that um, that uh, utility scale uh, solar is cheaper, and uh, that's that's being proven in um, you know in in Kauai. And so uh, why can't we do that? Doesn't that work? 
Um, and Kauai is really a good model for that. And um, in the future, it seems to me we can have solar. Uh, we can expand our use of solar just the way uh, KIUC is doing um, without having it on anybody's roof. And, and, and I've suggested before, I don't know if this works for you, uh, uh, Marco, but that what we ought to do is have all the solar installers make larger proposals, RFT proposals, uh, to the utility to build utility scale solar in every island. And that'll be cheaper. That'll be the 11 cent model. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that save us all a lot of money? Well, I'd probably like to get Mina's hit on this before I jump back in. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Jay, I, I just had a, a hard time. I'm not sure if you're too close to the mic for me. Mm. Um, but I, I, think, I think, well, my major issue is, okay, I have no problem with somebody making their own investment and making their choice for solar. But I do have a problem when their choice is dependent on subsidization by taxpayers and other ratepayers. So there's a lot of adjustments that need to go on regarding the value of solar. So that that's my basic concern. That if if you it's your choice whether you want to have um, a little power plant on your roof. But inherent but in what you're saying, Mina, you inherent in what you're saying is that solar is the one. You were talking before about having a diversified array of renewables, but in fact, um, in you know, in every island, solar seems to be uh, you know the most popular way of doing renewables. I mean, for example, in, on uh, Kauai, you, you don't have wind, and uh, I think they've made an intelligent choice not to have wind because people really don't like wind, um, and there was all this trouble in uh, Lanai about wind, and a big big island too. I mean, everybody likes solar. So what I take from the discussion so far is that. Solar is the way to meet the goals. Do you agree with that, Mina? I, you know, I, I, again, I, I support having a diversified portfolio. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we can't use more wind uh, resources on Kauai. But, I, again, if you look at Kauai, you know, they're making every attempt to diversify with biomass and um, hydro um, you know, on, onto the system. I, what I'm just saying is that, you know, we saw exponential growth in solar, and we saw that exponential growth primarily because of subsidization through tax credit and also net metering. You know, that trajectory can no longer continue at the expense of other ratepayers and taxpayers. And so, again, if you want to put solar, if you want to put energy storage on your individual home or your business, you shouldn't be relying on taxpayer and ratepayer money to make that investment for yourself. I mean, if you want to sell services back to the grid, those services should be properly valued that will benefit the entire system not just, you know, your pocketbook, again, at the expense of everybody else. So th there needs to be this real careful balancing right now as we move forward and a real concern about who pays as we move forward. Well, let me, let me throw this thought at Marco. Marco, you know, the thing about rooftop solar is that w it's not only the question of, um, of government subsidy. Uh, the fact is that rooftop solar, when, when it's allowed to proceed, you know, you don't have curtailment issues and regulatory issues and all that, as we've had. Um, it moves fast. People are excited about it. They want to do it for whatever reason. I'm not, I don't think it's limited to the, uh, you know, the subsidy. I think the fact is that we've had extraordinary growth uh, until a year or two ago, and it was all because people wanted to have rooftop solar. And if we don't, if we get off that, I'm, I'm arguing against my own point, but if we get off that um, and we leave it to another process and another product, um, the, the likelihood is we're going to slow down in, in reaching 100% and in, in being, um, you know, in, 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 in moving ahead and facilitating the development. And I, I, I sense that's part of what you were saying before about control. Uh, but I don't see it only as control. I, I see it as a market process where it moves much faster 
when you have a free market uh, among among our you know democratic citizens. Well, I mean, the reality, which I believe is indisputable, is that net energy metering, which existed from 2001 to October 2015, was an incentive and a uh, subsidy that was deemed to be of, of uh, adequate enough value uh, to promote solar, and it did tremendously. Uh, and then you also, we've also had both the federal and state tax credits, which have also been huge as far as offsetting a good chunk of the cost to homeowners and to investors. So it's clear that subsidies have been at play. It's clear that subsidies have benefited uh, not a small number of people. And I understand the argument. In fact, uh, I was one of the relative few in my industry back in 2015 when Hawaiian Electric announced in January 2015 that they wanted to end, bring net energy meaning to an end. I was one of the few that I actually supported that, and I still stand by it, although it's certainly been counter to my own business interest to do that. So it's kind of, you know, it's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, that you have in, in, in theory and in philosophy that there comes a time when the subsidy should be phased out, and then there's also the pain that that, that type of position, in my case, uh, uh, the pain that that inflicts by that moving forward, if, if, if that makes sense. Uh, but I mean, uh, just to hark back briefly to Hawaiian Electric's own proposal or own vision for the near-term introduction of more renewables, what I mean by near-term, this year, 2017 to 2021, and they are prognosticating or forecasting substantially, substantially more rooftop solar for all their service territories. So, you know, how did they get there? Why, why were they so supportive in their latest power supply, power supply improvement plan submitted to the commission December 23rd? Yeah, well, why? So, Do you know why? Do I know why? Yeah. Well, uh, I have to believe, uh, without being privy to their actual deliberations, that they see the value, both on uh, a practical and political perspective, uh, to have more rooftop solar. That that's, you know, there are very few people, I think, in general, who are against rooftop solar, per se. So it would have been impolitic, I think, to some extent, for them to, to not be supportive of a lot more rooftop solar. Well, so we got, the we question, got a, an interesting guys, situation I mean, the, here. The question is to what extent, in this particular example, various renewable energies in our state should be subsidized. To what extent? How much? How much should the, the majority pay to benefit a, a minority? That's the that, question. That's, that's really, I think, what that, we're trying to, that's the to cliffhanger. tear it out. And what we're going to do is take a, a, a short break. We're going to come back. I'd like to ask each of you, Mina first, what she proposes we do at this point, at this intersection, if you will, um, you know, made clear by the uh, obvious decline of solar installations. We'll be right back. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost-effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Hello and aloha. My name is Raya Salter, and I am the host of Power of Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to figure out how we're going to work towards a clean and renewable energy future. We have exciting conversations with all kinds of stakeholders, everyone who needs to come together to talk about renewable energy, be they engineers, advocates, lawyers, utility executives, musicians, or artists, to see how we can come together to make a renewable future, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Okay, we're back, we're live. We're here with Marco Mangelsdorf and Mina Morita. Uh, talking about energy in Hawaii and talking about the uh, decline of the solar installation industry. So um, I, I want to ask you guys, after the discussion and raising the point about, you know, should we have further, um, you know, subsidies or not? Should we leave it to individual homeowners to build without subsidies? Or should we uh, expect the utility to do, uh, you know, utility-scale solar? Uh, let me ask you what, what you suggest in the way of um, a program. 
what, 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 um, what are your suggestions for a specific uh, initiative going forward to deal with this? Uh, Mina, you first. Well, I think it, it's really premature to look at another new energy storage tax credit. Right now, um, the way the tax office is interpreting the current um, renewable energy income tax credit is that storage is included um, in that tax credit. So, you know, without understanding the ramifications of rooftop solar on the entire system and the um, the impacts on on <laughs> taxpayers, <laughs> definitely we should not jump into the fire with another new tax credit. Um, okay, me, uh, Mark, what do you think? Do you think the tax credit should be reinstated or increased? Sorry, I, I, um, you're breaking up on me, Jay. Oh, sorry. Marco, uh, what, what, uh, what should we do? Well, uh, we're going to be, we're waiting for the the Distributed Energy Resources Docket, or DER, or DER Docket, to play out this year as the Commission and the interveners and the Consumer Advocate hammer out whatever Phase 2 is going to be. And I would like to see some type of interconnect agreement, some type of tariff that would still be available or be available under in Phase 2 that would allow for exporting into to the grid your surplus PV power, number one, and number two, for that surplus power to uh, accrue some type of value, some type of credit value, whether it's not going to be retail because NEM is dead and gone, but that's what I would like to see under the DER docket. And regarding the uh, proposed new state tax credit, or one that's you know working in both uh, the House and the, and the Senate in our legislature right now, uh, as far as should there be a new state tax credit specifically for storage, and even though I haven't seen the versions of the bill or read them verbatim, line by line, I would think that it's covering both residential on the, the customer side of the meter and then also probably utility scale solar. I would have to say, again, this is reflecting my narrow self-interest as a business owner in solar, that given the whammies that the industry has received and that consumer choices have been limited, more limited, and that the cost has gone up, I would have to say when all is said and done, I believe that an energy storage tax credit would be something that I, I would support. If it gets through uh, conference committee and all it gets to the governor's desk, uh, then it's something that uh, I would be in favor of because I think we need something if, in fact, we do value, if we do value a, a vital... Uh, or a, a PV industry here, a local PV industry, that is, that is healthy and sustainable. And, um, uh, Mina, would you agree or disagree with that approach? I, I, I disagree with it. I mean, if, if they want to offer um, some incentive to, especially residential owners that have already take, taken advantage of the renewable energy income tax credit for energy storage, they should have a GEMS program that loans them the money, mm. not, not a tax credit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to have the same people benefiting from, you know, government handouts rather than expanding the um, benefits yeah. to a broader um, Well, that's, that's interesting about the GEMS program because so far the GEMS program has not been successful uh, by any standard. Let me, let me go to one last point before we run out of time, and that is there's a suggestion out there to increase the number of commissioners on the PUC from three to five. Mina, you were sitting as the chair for several years on the PUC. What do you think about that? I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, com uh, increasing the commissioners three to five? Um, I, you know, this really is a legislative decision that as the... Uh, um, consumer Protection Chair has said, has sort of indicated a desire for a more diverse um, commission, um, including uh, gender, geographic, and expertise diversity. So one of the ways you get it is expanding the number of commissioners. 
Okay, what about you, Marco? Do you agree with that? Would you like to see, you think it would be beneficial for the number of commissioners to be increased? I think in principle going from three to five makes sense for the good reasons that Mina mentioned. I mean, uh, California, of course, is a much larger state than Hawaii, but it's, it's our closest neighbor, essentially, and they have had five commissioners for quite a number of years. So in terms of having a greater diversity, greater geographical uh, representation, I mean, because right now, uh, all the f uh, commission members are uh, based on Oahu and living on Oahu before or under MENA. Uh, we at least had good uh, Mike Champley from Maui. So I think having greater uh, representation of, of views across our, our canoe state, so to speak, um, is, is a good thing. Well, it's nice to hear you guys agreeing on that. So we have one issue, pretty important issue, where you don't necessarily agree. And on that one, which may or may not happen, uh, in fact, neither of these may happen, <laughs> Uh, you agree on the second one. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Mina, Marco, and me, on uh, energy updates around the state. And I hope you guys are ready to come back two weeks from now. We'll catch up on the latest news and make more analysis uh, here on ThinkTech. Thanks so much.